And here's two pictures of it. One comes from string theory and one comes from loop quantum gravity, what Planck scale geometry might look like. And the, the point here is that the average length of these voxels or the edges are average one Planck length, 10 to the minus 33 centimeter, but the arrangement possibilities are infinite and this repeats uh, throughout the universe is also fractal and holographic. So information embedded here can repeat at higher and higher scales and uh, throughout, throughout the universe. It can be holographic, even reaching biological scales. This suggests there is indeed a deeper hidden reality that uh, Plato's cave was, was driving at. It may not look like this, but something's, something's there beyond uh, our normal conscious perception. This is also consistent with Eastern philosophy, in which consciousness pervades a deeper level of reality. So let me talk a little bit about the theory, the penrose hemeroth orc or theory. OR is objective reduction, Roger's mechanism which brings in consciousness. ORC is orchestration, which has to do with the organization of these OR events through biological synaptic feedback and microtubule associated proteins and so forth. So the basic idea is that in a microtubule inside a neuron, each protein could be a qubit, a quantum bit. And so the, the gray ones would be quantum and you reach a threshold, there's objective reduction, a moment of bing right there. And this, the microtubule quantum state spread between neurons by gap junctions. And here's a diagram of a conscious moment. So the quantum state builds up, reaches threshold here. Uh, this can be plotted. There's the uh, uh, Schrodinger ev evolution of the Schrodinger equation by conti uh, continuous. So it reaches threshold, then R reduction, OR reduction. And here's what's happening in space-time geometry. There's a separation in space-time geometry here and it collapses here to one. So one branch of this universe dies off and this one continues, and that's the choice of the selection made. It could be a particular perception or a particular choice. A sequence of such moments happening at 25 milliseconds with, with gamma synchrony would look something like this, and it includes quantum information which can go backward in time, which can explain a number of physiological events and also uh, rescue us from being epiphenomenal. Because if there's backward time effects in the brain, the activity uh, that, um, that occurs too late may actually uh, not be the relevant activity. It may, be that we, it may be sending information backward in time so that we can have conscious control of our actions, even if the measurable correlate comes too late. So this shows consciousness as a sequence of moments using the OR mechanism that Roger and I developed. Now he's, he's expanded the OR to include Diossi, who had a similar idea. There's some slight variations, but we just do some calculations for different physiological events to show the number of tubulins inside a neuron, and there's about 10 to the eighth uh, tubulins per neuron. So we're talking roughly 20,000 to 100,000 neurons per conscious moment. And the, the superposition separation of any physicists out there only occurs at the level of carbon atomic nuclei. So let me see if this is going to run. Within the brain is a forest of neurons. The principal way brain cells communicate with each other is by exchanging chemicals. That's the large-scale view which all biologists understand. But in the neurons is a denser jungle of tiny structures called microtubules. Constantly flickering when you're conscious, they stop functioning under anesthetic. Hammeroff concluded these microtubules must be an essential element in what creates consciousness. They create a secluded environment where quantum events could occur. He believes it's due to these quantum events that consciousness occurs at all. Sounds better with an English accent sometimes, I think. <laughs> okay, I want, to, uh, I want to show a little experimental evidence for this. Uh, this is from the work of uh, Anurban Banjapati at, uh, at National Institute of Material Sciences in, in Japan. I know there's a mixed audience, so I'm, just, I'm going to go through this quickly. but. Uh, it's kind of interesting uh, what he did. Th these are not microtubules, these are fullerene tubes or something. But he did a, several, a number of interesting experiments where he, for example, grew microtubules in the presence of applied, uh, applied alternating current fields. And he found that at certain frequencies they grew very rapidly. They just assembled almost instantly. And he, he's uh, calling that a uh, Froelich condensation. Froelich predicted this kind of quantum coherence in biology. And I should say that, that a lot of physicists and scientists are very skeptical 
of the quantum consciousness business that I've been talking about. Because if you try to build a quantum computer in the laboratory, uh, you have to do it at absolute zero uh, to avoid any vibration. Well, we've always thought that biology and evolution have figured this out and, and using this secluded environment, uh, been able to uh, have quantum coherence occur in warm biological systems. And sure enough, in the last six, seven years, there's been a number of uh, studies showing this from photosynthesis to ion channels to DNA, and now with Honor Brown's work, microtubules at room temperature. So this shows that they grow very rapidly, possibly due to a, a uh, quantum condensation. And uh, here, here's the growth as a function of frequency. Now, so here's the experiment here. The red thing is a microtubule, okay? It's, it's 25 nanometers in diameter. It might be a few hundred uh, or thousand uh, nanometers long. He puts four electrodes on it. So here are the electrodes. He just grows the microtubule here uh, across them. So essentially it's uh, four electrodes. And uh, he met, so two of them he records from, and two of them he puts in uh, uh, AC field, and he measures uh, or voltage, and he put and he measures resistance over here, and the resistance, uh, uh, the following resistance, starting out they're good insulators, they're not very conductive because most proteins aren't, but at certain frequencies, for example, eight megahertz here, and about oh, this is twelve kilohertz, sorry, no, this is megahertz, I, I, and then. 20, there's these huge drops in resistance. And here, here's the kilohertz here, 12. So he found eight resonance peaks where microtubules act as quantum conductors, uh, almost superconductors. Uh, the only reason they're not superconductors is that there's resistance in the contacts. So uh, they're put into some kind of quantum state at, at warm biological temperatures. And their length depends on the resonant frequency. And uh, the coherence time is at least uh, uh, 0.1 milliseconds, maybe longer. Here's the, uh, here's the microtubule in red. And uh, then he measured interference. And quantum interference is the sine qua non of, of uh, quantum states. And in the most amazing results, he, for specific frequencies, resonant frequencies shown here, he got specific and different uh, interference patterns on the microtubule. This suggests there's some kind of code here, since each, each of these uh, some kind of uh, a resonant code or the possibility of a code, since uh, they seem to also correlate with these particular patterns around the microtubule uh, lattice. So his obser ob observation was that microtubules break the quantum limits. All the other uh, quantum stuff has been along this curve. So you, you either very fast, if, if you want to be at warm temperature, you have to be very, very uh, short-lived or if you want to be uh, long-lasting, you have to be very, very cold. But microtubules breaks the limit because you, you, can, you can have it at warm temperature and last fairly long. And that's probably due to the evolution and design because the more you study microtubules, the more interesting they become, at least to me and many, many others now. So if you look inside a microtubule, we see these aromatic rings, which is where uh, hydrophobic uh, pockets, are. these are the hydrophobic pockets, and uh, where anesthetics bind and also Although most people think the psychedelics act strictly at receptors, they may also act in, in these pockets too. And the pathways that he discovered, we had proposed, were topological qubits based on Fibonacci geometry. So electron resonance in microtubules. Okay, just a few more slides and I'll be done. And I want to talk about a couple different but related things. The first one is that the microtubules, remember the brain is full of neurons, which, is full of, which are full of microtubules, and also glial cells, which are full of microtubules, um, resonating in the, in the megahertz range. So in the last few years, there have been a number of new types of therapies, transcranial electrical, transcranial magnetic, and now transcranial ultrasound. This is about a grant that a colleague of mine, William Tyler, got uh, from the military to study effects of ultrasound on the brain. Now, this is non-invasive. You just put it on the surface of the brain. It turns out if you do that, you get all kinds of interesting effects. And uh, Jamie, for one, is promising, is, is suggesting it may be useful for not only Alzheimer's, but various mental uh, diseases, depression, uh, stroke, uh, <clears throat> pretty much anything you can think of. And if they're vibrating the microtubules, I think he may be right. Now, he doesn't know the mechanism. We had a big talk about this. And now he's on the microtubule bandwagon. It could be that this type of thing might be a, a new type of uh, medical device, non-invasive, and perhaps even entertainment and sort of a meditation aid. because. Uh, we did a study on it on chronic pain patients and found that uh, it improved mood after exposure to uh, ultrasound to the brain at about 
8 megahertz. I've tried it myself. It's kind of interesting. So something to look out for in the future, transcranial ultrasound. And the final point I want to make is, some, again, something uh, uh, more or less unrelated, but um, this is about my colleague uh, Roger Penrose, who, uh, among other things, six months ago, uh, had a book come out called Cycles of Time. And uh, it suggested that the universe was preceded by another universe. In other words, the Big Bang was preceded by another universe, and that was preceded by another universe, and so forth. In other words, serial universes rather than parallel universes. And uh, he wrote about it in the book, and the basic idea is shown here, uh, that there was something before the Big Bang, which suggested that maybe you could see evidence of it in the cosmic microwave background. So this guy, uh, an Armenian astronomer, Gajadian, uh, found evidence in the cosmic microwave background, and they just published this uh, recently. And this is the cosmic microwave background treated in a certain way. Uh, with, with the Milky Way here, so you, you can't see through the Milky Way. And uh, usually it's supposed to be fairly random and heterogeneous, but they found these rings, you can see, and concentric rings, which they claim uh, are evidence for violent explosions, giant black hole collisions in the universe preceding this one. Now this is not my field, and perhaps I shouldn't talk about it because I know there's some cosmologists here, but I just find this so intriguing and interesting, and it makes sense to me, you know, as opposed to the view put forth in Hawking and Mladenow's book, uh, <coughs> Grand Design, where the universe just sprang from nothing for no apparent reason. Uh, this, the idea here is that the universe, <coughs> um, it runs out of heat, and then there's some kind of funny business with entropy, and there's another big bang, and eventually it happens again and again, and perhaps the laws of uh, the physical constants change each time, which would be a solution to the anthropic principle, because the universe would be evolving and mutating over cycles and cycles, and even reincarnating. So that, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. So let me, uh, let me, uh, <clears throat> one, oh no, I have one more topic here. At, uh, so here's the Orko uh thing, and quantum space-time geometry neutral monism. The fact that um, we think that the heart problem is solved by the redness of the rose being a particular pattern in space-time geometry the curvature that is reproduced in the brain, and that the platonic influences that Penrose talked about in terms of ethical and aesthetic values can actually guide our, our, our perceptions and actions in a way similar to what's described in, in various spiritual approaches. And this was a conference we just had in Stockholm. Uh, it's, it's still on the web, uh, and will be. And one of the speakers, um, actually two speakers, were talking about near death and, and out of body experiences and afterlife and, or the possibility. And, uh, you know, near death experiences, I uh, first heard about uh, a number of years ago, and I was asked to comment on it, see how it relates to our uh, uh, Orko Ar theory. And so I gave an answer that I'll tell you about in a second. But the basic idea, and this is very common uh, going back thousands of years, is there's you know, a white light and a tunnel, and in some cases, leaving the body. Now, um, there have been two studies in the last year on measuring brain activity pati on patients as they die. These are patients who are terminal and choose to die. The families agree. Support is withdrawn. Um, over a period of time, they die. And uh, they try to do it as painlessly and as, as, with as much dignity as possible. And a couple of uh, physicians have started to put these brain monitors on which uh, are basically EEG, the processed EEG, which are used in anesthesia, so measure depth of anesthesia. And what they found in, in two different studies, and this was reported at the Stockholm conference by Dr. Lochner Chala from George Washington University, although this is from a, a different study, is that the, the number over here is the EEG from zero, uh, it's not, it's processed EEG, so it's just a raw number, zero to 100, where 80 to 100 is awake, uh, more or less, uh, for anesthesia, you want them between 40 and 60. That'll guarantee that they're not conscious, according to the machine. Below 40 is too deep, and 60 to 80 is kind of no man's land. So they turned off, and this is representative of all the, all the cases, although this one lasted a lot longer. <clears throat> so the number, as the heart stops, and the heart has stopped about here, patient's pretty much clinically dead, the EG has gone to zero, and then there's a burst of activity, which in this case lasts 20 minutes. 